and when you were born? My name is Gerald Martin. I was born in Scotland in 1930, which makes me just coming up to 87. Can you tell me about your family? What did your father do? My father was a uh, ear, nose and throat consultant at uh, the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Uh, had been in the First World War, uh, had won a medal then, uh, but by the Second World War he was of course uh, over the top. Uh, my mother was a nurse. Uh, we were brought up in Scotland. Uh, that's it. What was it like growing up in Scotland? You'll have to speak out louder. What was it like growing up in Scotland? Well, I grew up to the age of uh, nine in Scotland. I went to uh, school in Scotland, in Ed outside Edinburgh. But then from nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, to 12, uh, I was in the America, so I came back to Scotland and immediately went away to school, to a boarding school in Scotland. But uh, to me, it, it was just home. I loved it. And most of my life was spent with my grandparents in Inverness, and farming in Inverness, and doing holidays in Inverness. So I loved it. Can you remember the build-up to war? Can I remember? The build-up to war. What was the, the feeling like? I was at a boarding school outside Edinburgh. And uh, in the summer holiday, we went to my fa grandfather's in Inverness. And there we went to church, which we usually did. And there we heard that war had been declared. And from my point of view, that was the first thing I understood or began, because I was only nine. And I began to understand what war was. Uh, so that was the beginning of it. And then when I went back to school uh, outside Edinburgh, I remember distinctly that we had a Heinkel aeroplane, German, flying very low over the school, having previously dropped a bomb uh, in the f fourth bridge, which didn't hit the fourth bridge. And at the same time, uh, my father went to hospitals outside Edinburgh to work, and he had a bomb dropped just behind his car um, from another, uh, that's the only war time that I knew really in Scotland. What was it like moving over to America? When I went to America, mm -hmm. What, what was it like, sort of, as a child, the changes you saw from life in Scotland to...? It, we were very lucky in that we weren't evacuated to, to America. Uh, we went out with a lot of other evacuees, but in fact we were going to visit a great aunt of mine, so that made our entrance into America a, a lot more easy. Uh, the crossing uh, was very difficult in that it uh, was a packed ship with a lot of uh, refugees coming from uh, Germany and Holland. Um, and when we got to New York, uh, we were met by friends of my aunts, so that that introduced us more easily. And the other thing was that we'd always read the geographic paper and it used to have advertisements for American cars. And so my brother and I knew American cars in New York, and it was all great fun. Mm -hmm. Did you ever worry about what might happen? Sorry? Did you ever worry about what might happen? Or, or was it sort of you were over there and because at that point America wasn't involved in the war? I, 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 th I think that we were excited we had to cross, my brother and I, because he was four years older, but uh, I was nine and he was 13, and we had to cross America by train 
all on our own. Uh, that was exciting, but again, we were met by friends in Los Angeles, so it made life easier. So it was all exciting. How was the build-up to war different in America? In America? Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. In the Hawaiian Islands, uh, they believed completely that they were safe, that they could never be attacked, that they could never have anything to do with war, that uh, they were just hidden in the ground, not understanding. And if you look at history, you will see that time and time and time and time again, they were warned and told that war was likely to come, they were likely to get bombed. Um, and by that time, I was uh, getting on for 11. And I, I was worried then, because I thought, well, this is the way I started in Scotland. Is it going to start here? Conditions like over there? Oh, very good. I was very lucky. My great aunt lived in a lovely house uh, overlooking the whole of uh, Honolulu. Um, the school that I went to there was the school that uh, President Obama went to. Um, so it was a very good school uh, and I was very happy uh, until Pearl Harbor. Completely and utterly different from uh, Scotland, that, that's for sure. Uh, very much more uh, fancy fruits. Uh, we dug pineapples, sugar, pineapples, uh, coffee, uh, all were sort of in the garden. All the <coughs> fruits that now you can get in supermarkets, they were all in our garden. Uh, and because it was warm, uh, we tended to eat light things. No, it was fine. So, I know you mentioned Pearl Harbor. Can you tell me a little bit about that? First of all, in retrospect, Everyone who had anything to do with the services uh, had been told time and time and time again that war was likely to become and that Japan was likely to attack. But nobody paid any interest whatsoever. On the morning of, of the Sunday, I was at my aunt's house and she had a flat place on the roof that I used to go out and sit on. And uh, sitting on the roof, I saw one plane, just one aeroplane, and it was dropping uh, what I thought must be uh, flower bombs. You know, it was just dropping a big thing down on Honolulu. And I ran in and said to my aunt, you know, there's a plane out there dropping. And she said, oh, nonsense. And because we lived up a, a valley near uh, Honolulu, um, we didn't really hear or see what was going on in Pearl Harbor. But later that morning, uh, Sunday morning, I bicycled down into Honolulu to meet my friends there. And then we saw all the flames, we saw the fire in, in the distance. And I've actually got a paper uh, that I bought in uh, Honolulu at that time, which says war has been declared. Uh, and we cycled out to a friend of mine who lived in the hills above Pearl Harbor. And we saw the, uh, the whole of Pearl Harbor on fire. We saw all the sunken, sinking ships. We saw through the binoculars, looking down on the harbour, it was just uh, terrible. And I, I was only 11, but I was old enough and had all, enough experience, particularly having travelled, uh, 
to realize that this was more than frightening, this was just terrible. And I uh, was deeply disturbed because everything was on fire. It was, it was fire more than anything and smoke and because the bombers had left by the time I got there. There were still a few stragglers going but mainly the bombing was over but now the terrible fires so the water covered with oil was just burning everywhere and even at that age I, I was frightened very much so and then being Sunday I, I was a Cub Scout an American or Cub Scout and we met uh, our scout teacher uh, in the evening and we went naturally to meet him it would be about five o'clock four o'clock and he took us to the not the military hospital but to the hospital in Honolulu uh, where there were people who had been wounded burnt uh, people who were dying uh, or hanging all around and sulfur drugs, uh, uh, antibiotic, had just come into knowledge and it was a powder and with our, our cub master uh, we went round powdering all, all the people that it seems funny that an 11 year old was asked to do this but I was the son of a, a doctor and he had said we must learn because this is the beginning of war and we can help and and so we had to powder all, all these people and, and that was the day of Pearl Harbor following the day of Pearl Harbor uh, I think I'm right in saying a third of the population in the Hawaiian Islands in, in, in Hawaii itself in Oahu uh, were Japanese. We had two Japanese maids, my aunt had two Japanese maids, Natsuko and Sadako, who had been with her for 15 years. Uh, we had Japanese friends at school, um, but uh, were the Japanese on our side or were they not on our side? Uh, and the first thing we heard was that a whole lot of them had been dragged off and put in a prison. Uh, they were perfectly normal, ordinary people. Uh, but the next thing was that we'd heard that the water was poisoned and you mustn't drink the water. Uh, and the next thing we heard was that they had dropped a whole lot of bombs, not in the uh, airfields and in, in uh, around the harbour necessarily, but to do harm in the ground. And so the fear of all this went on. Uh, then we understood that there were no planes, no... It was really rather silly now that I come to think of it. Uh, because at night uh, they started uh, having blackout. Uh, oh, straight away, absolutely everything had to be completely and utterly blackout. Uh, but on one of the... on the big island of Hawaii, uh, there was a volcano erupting and the sky was actually lit up. I mean, we could see it some hundred miles away. We could see all the red in the... so that the Japanese didn't have much trouble if they wanted to come and... Uh, and everyone was... They just didn't understand. They couldn't believe that this was war. And I think my brother and I were, were more... Uh, sensitive to it, uh, more realizing that that was it, more appreciating that uh, you wouldn't be able to phone uh, abroad, that you wouldn't be able to send letters abroad, that you wouldn't be able to get a boat abroad, that all this, whereas they were rushing around madly trying to find ways out of Hawaii. Does that help? Yeah. At what point was the decision made to bring you home, back to Scotland? Sorry? 
At what point was the decision made to bring you back to Scotland? We wanted to get back. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as soon as Pearl Harbour was over, mm -hmm. uh, we thought, well, we came out here to be safe. Uh, what on earth's the point of staying here? Uh, because again, or the Americans thought, my gosh, they're, they're going to bomb it all again, and da da da. Uh, but th there was no way of uh, the, the ships that travel between uh, Hawaii and uh, United States, um, there just weren't enough to take anyone. So we were stuck there, we were enjoying school, we were with my aunt, so we, we merely wanted to go as soon as possible. Then, when my brother was 16, 17, I think, he graduated from school and, of course, immediately wanted to go to college, which would be back home in Britain. But we couldn't get back to Britain. We could get back to the United States. So we went back in the United States to, again, friends of my aunt's, uh, and he went to college. And I went to a Quaker boarding school, which was unusual, but rather fun. And it took us a year being there uh, before we could get a boat back. In after that year, my brother was then old enough for the army. And so the British said, yeah, come, 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 we'll get you a boat because we want you for the army. So he got a boat back and I was left, uh, but by some, I don't quite know how it worked, to be perfectly honest, uh, but I got a job as being a, a naval apprentice and I was only 13 at the time. And but as an apprentice, I was put on board uh, a, a, I forgot what you call them now, a carrier, uh, that, a brand new carrier that had just been built in America and was being shipped back with uh, plane, planes on board. Uh, and so I got a, a carrier to get me back to, which was very nice. How was it coming back to Scotland from being in America? Ah, back to uh, that's. Uh, I went back to boarding school, uh, just outside Edinburgh, uh, and I, I, that's where I had been as a, before. And uh, my first term, I, I broke all the records for getting whacked by the master for one reason or another, uh, and I had a pretty difficult time coming to terms, uh, but once that was over, I, I was very, very happy to be back home and, and loved school thereafter. What was the feeling when war ended? We marched, my school marched, we had uh, cadets, a uh, cadet body at school and we marched through Musselboro, which is just outside Edinburgh, uh, with our bagpipes playing, and uh, it was great fun. <laughs> and can you tell me a little bit about your life after the war? Uh, yes, uh, I was at school until I was 17, and uh, qualified for university and went up to Edinburgh University to do medicine and spent the first two years uh, doing medicine quite reasonably. And my father died suddenly and when he was rather uh, unexpected and early and it knocked me sideways and uh, I, I just lost it, never did any work. And uh, they said, you know, you haven't passed your exams, you have to leave. So I left Edinburgh and was immediately taken up into national service and uh, sent off to the army, went through basic training. And then luckily I, I was chosen as an officer and went through officer cadet 
and luckily I got this medal for that and uh, went and joined the tank regiment and from the tank regiment I was sent out to Egypt in the Middle East when uh, Britain was trying to have a little battle with Egypt and uh, following that uh, my regiment was sent out to Hong Kong and uh, I went out as a tank uh, commander uh, and spent 10 months in Hong Kong loving it and came back and went back to Edinburgh and said words to the effect of, you know, I've got over my father dying, I, I promise that I can work. And, and they set me some exams which I managed to pass. And uh, so I, I became a doctor. And having become a doctor, uh, I got married to a, that was 56 years ago. And uh, we started in Scotland uh, in general practice, never meaning to leave Scotland because that was our home that we believed in, we were both brought up there. And out of the blue, uh, I had an invitation to go to Melton Mowbray in Leicestershire uh, to, to do a job there, which wasn't just general practice, it was also looking after a hospital. It was also doing all the maternity work, and it was also looking after the veterinary corps, which was in Melton Mowbray. And so I worked there for 40 years. Yes, 40 years, I think and uh, then retired and uh, by that time I had grandchildren and the grandchildren needed to look after so we moved into a smaller house uh, so that we could help out. We've been doing that ever since. How do you think your experiences as a child shaped your experiences as an adult? I think they had much greater effect on me than I fully realized. I, I came through the, the whole of that uh, four years in America and then the following early years at school. I came through with, without apparently any upset, psychological upset. But I think that it hit me uh, slowly thereafter. And I think that the f fear that I had looking down on Pearl Harbor, I think that the fear that I had crossing two oceans uh, and both times uh, being chased apparently by submarines and on one occasion uh, dropping bombs uh, on submarines, so-called. I, I think this disturbed me more than I fully... And then when my father died, I think that just knocked me off. And finally, do you have any words of advice for the future generations? No, I, I don't think that any generation can advise a following generation. Uh, there is so much that I want, I was very lucky in that we had three children uh, and, and they developed well and followed the way we had been brought up to a very great extent. But their children are, are completely different, they're, they're young, they're they're into different things, they're into different ideas. They're, I don't think we can advise them because they, they live in a new world. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay.